SARMs, can they cause hair loss? This is such a hot topic this day and age, not just in the internet, but actually in my office. As my staff tells me, they receive multiple phone calls all day long from young men asking questions specifically about SARMs and hair loss and if the doc knows about it. So I decided to really do some research properly and to really present and produce a great video for everyone. So here it is. So many young men that want muscle building, they realize steroids are there and they're uh, concerned about that, which is good. Uh, so they're turning to SARMs early and with the, the potential um, that they will build muscle and protect their hair and forget the other medical issues. It's, it's hair protection, which is amazing to me. Because 20, 30 years ago, I think steroid users, we didn't have SARMs and they did steroids and um, they were obviously concerned about their hair because I don't think there's really a difference in that perception in our society. But um, with the SARMs, there's this conceptual ability that we could use them and have specificity for muscle building and leave out all the other side effects, which this is, this is amazing. So that's what they're thinking of. They're thinking how a SARM, which is a selective androgen receptor modulator versus an andro genic anabolic steroid, how they can use this agent and avoid hair loss. So what agents are they using? There's many SARMs and in my research I found out that it's Osterin, LGD4033, which is Legandrol, and S4 uh, Andrian, uh, which is, those are some of the common ones, mainly Osterin and, and Legandrol. Uh, are the ones that I saw being talked about and, and specifically on the interviews. So what's going on? What I did was I decided to interview the guys in the street. So I had access to some men, young men, and I they're not patients, and I asked them about this. And the overall perception from those guys, uh, I have to say, is that SARMs are neutral. And because there's tons of stuff in the internet that they're bad, but then there's stuff in the internet that they're neutral, and even SARMs could even protect or grow your hair. We'll get into that. Uh, that's one group, my interviews. And you guys, thank you so much for the men, uh, the decent young men I talked to. Thank you so much. Uh, next was online. I did my research like anyone else uh, and got online for a few hours. I did this over the, about, about a week or two, uh, in between work, of course. And the last part was I contacted some of my actual patients. Uh, that I thought would uh, give me some good insight in this. So um, the online also is plus and minus on SARMs with hair, hair loss. This is just my overall bottom line summary. And this is as far as like, do SARMs, can they lead to hair loss? And so the guys in the streets, those few young men, they were pretty neutral about it because both plus and minus, but overall I think more positive than negative. Number two online, about the same. I, I think it probably mimics what's going on online. And then my patients that I've had upwards of 10 years under my personal care, they definitely have poor, they had poor experiences and perception on SARMs uh, on hair loss. But then again, maybe the guys I take are probably more guys that are using steroids. So I thought that was interesting. So what are the regimens? Let's get right into the regimens. That was kind of the basics of how I develop my data. The regimens. SARMs, you're going to have to talk about are they selective when we're talking about the hair follicle and the DHT receptor. And if we talk about what regimens are used, either the SARM by itself, which it is the essence of just the SARM by itself, and will that lead to the hair loss without any other agent? Well, about half the time I see that they're adding other agents. So what are the other agents? They're DHT blockers, finasteride, dudasteride, uh, minoxidil. These are medicines, these are generic medicines uh, that are uh, both prescription-based and over-the-counter for hair loss. There's ketoconazole, 
which can come in the form of a shampoo. It's an antifungal medication. There's uh, azelic acid, which is a topical. So there it is. And I do have to give at this point a disclaimer that I am not making any recommendations for the use of these medicines. That's why I'm specifically not going to mention the regimens inherently with the doses and the actual regimens. I have to give a disclaimer that this is not for it or against it. This is strict educational purpose. Thank you so much. So let's talk about the mechanisms of action. Okay. In, in concept, the cell arm itself is going to have a low or zero affinity for that hair follicle receptor. That's the thought. And, and that's where this is all coming from if you do your reading. So the SARM itself, these different SARMs, Osterin, Ligandrol, Andarine, there's many other ones. They, they themselves, in a dose-dependent fashion, obviously a little bit of the SARM versus more and more up to a high dose, you're going to have more dose-dependent phenomenon, especially hair loss. And it's also man per man. So that, that's my take-home message. And the interesting pieces of the molecular aspect and the medical, the physiological side of this to me is two things I want to present that I found to be absolutely amazing. This is more in the internet reading uh, from these men. They're, they're such, so bright. These are real bro science guys and we all learn from these guys. It's really just a kind of a ad hoc study online. That's why we need to harness this more and study this and that's what I'm doing, you know, with the real academic guys, which they're out there. So it's great that we're moving forward on this. So the SARMs, what happens at the DHT higher follicle receptor? The anecdotes, there are anecdotal evidence that there's, there's something called, there's a competitive inhibition at that receptor cell site for the, the potential to neutralize or even protect from androgen and DHT on that follicle because the SARM is competing and actually attaching onto it and therefore protecting it from the DHT to block. And therefore, in this type of physiologic molecular setup, receptor stimulatory or inhibition setup, you're going to get neutralization or maybe even hair growth. So that's where that comes from. And I find that to be amazing. That's amazing to me. The next piece that's amazing is, it seems like on SARMs, with or without some of these agents, men may not have hair loss or much hair loss, and there's so much genetics. Even me, it's genetic. There's just genetics. So what happens is, what I have to bring to mind, it's so amazing, is when men come off the SARMs, there seems to be an upregulation or downregulation, depending on what time you're seeing it, of this receptor where it starts to speed up, that would be the upregulation component coming off an agent and it's imbalanced and then the DHT is stronger and then you see hair shedding. So I found that to be amazing through all my reading. I started seeing this more and more and some of the men mentioned this to me. Very complicated mechanisms and no one really understands really how they work. Next piece, the SARMs and the DHT agents. So these, these DHT blocking agents, what are they? And I have to say at this point, you know, why it's not widely done is because men on testosterone that need it or that don't even need testosterone, men, that angiogen receptor that's in your brain, the limbic brain, on testosterone, not to mention steroids, men feel phenomenal. This is why the problem that we have is it's a good problem to have. Your brain feels phenomenal. Your, your, your sex is better. You're confident. Of course, not too much. You can get uh, uh, be bombastic, arrogant, and actually wreck your life. And there's roid rage, we all know. That's an asshole. It's an asshole on steroids. I don't want to see an asshole on steroids. And everyone knows that. But there's confidence. There's energy. So why would someone want to block these effects? Because it's testosterone and DHT on the brain. We'll get into that in a minute. So it's a trade-off. The two drugs that are used, these two DHT agents, let's talk about them, what they really are. Finasteride is a 70% blocker of DHT type 2, and that's really a, it's a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, and that's what we're talking about. The next one is dutasteride, and that's a, a 1 and 2 blocker for DHT, and that's a stronger agent. What are these used for? Finasteride is been the, the Fed has an indication for BPH, and I'm not going to go into the, the, the doses, and male pattern balding. 
and that's really on record. That's what it's used for. Off-label, very interesting, prostate uh, cancer prevention for men over the 50, over 55 years old. That's a lot of data on this, and it's it's that is not ever been conclusive, but it's very interesting. So dutasteride, um, they actually have the use is only for BPH versus finasteride, where it's male pattern balding and BPH. Very interesting. They give a warning on dutasteride that you're going to lower your PSA, this is a prostate-specific antigen, it's a screening mark for prostate cancer for men, uh, middle-aged men or older, and it will tank that by 50%. So you're setting up a whole new baseline for PSA, and you could be using this medicine and missing, masking the effect of a growing adenoma, prostate cancer. I found that to be absolutely fascinating. So those are the agents, and my disclaimer stands, there's, there's no recommendation in those agents, please. It's just strictly educational. Next piece. Do SARMs, so do SARMs and DHT blockers or SARMs itself, will there be hair loss? It's man per man. It's SARM per SARM if you're actually getting SARMs. You could see a, a, uh, a article that I took part in in the New York Times, uh, A Better Body in a Pill, about SARMs with my colleague, Dr. Bashane at Harvard Medical School, where he uh, did a study on the SARMs and what are SARMs, and he found out 50% of the ones that he purchased on the internet were bogus. Please see that article and my and that study that I was quoted in um, on the New York Times um, review. So, SARMs and DHT blockers, let's talk about that. Will it work? Can you take a SARM or a steroid, anabolic androgenic steroid, and can you use one of these blockers and will it work? It will work. It, it definitely will work. There's no question. I've seen it anecdotally, and the studies are there for it too. But, so it will work to prevent hair loss or slow hair loss down. But, at what cost? Is it worth it? What are the two bottom lines? Finasteride syndrome and loss of muscle, potentially. Finasteride syndrome. This is a side effect of finasteride. Remember, this is a DHT blocker. You need DHT in your brain to feel well is in addition to testosterone. So there is a huge warning on finasteride, and I've seen this. I've taken men in my practice that have suffered from finasteride syndrome. Now, these are men that have not been using androgens. They've not been using steroids co-administered. They're just men, typically young middle-aged men, and they take finasteride to prevent the hair loss, and they suffer with low T symptoms, depression, even anxiety. There's even been suicides. So, but it can it cause low T. So be very careful. So at what cost? The cost is gonna be finasteride syndrome. The cost is gonna be, will it affect your sex drive? And I think it does. I think anecdotally from all the thousands of men I've talked to, it, they see, it seems like it's not worth it. If you're on testosterone, they don't wanna lower that effect for the brain. It's amazing. But some men tell me that, no doc, there is a level and you can balance it and they could feel well. Again, this is incredible. Definitely need to study this more. The other very amazing uh, aspect and clinical side of using a SARM or a steroid with a DHT blocker would be a very interesting study of do you lose muscle tissue? So you could take a testosterone itself antigen, uh, steroid or a SARM, and you can hold on to hair. That seems to be true, but are you going to have the side effects? Next piece, are you going to lose muscle tissue because you're blocking at the receptor DHT site in skeletal muscle, which up until recently, and we still don't know how much relevance of that exists in the, in the muscle, the skeletal muscle. And based on a study, very interesting study that I, I checked into, it's um, in JAMA, 2012, March 7th, the effect of testosterone supplementation with or without a dual 5-alpha reductase inhibitor on fat-free mass in men with suppressed testosterone production in a randomized control trial. So my uh, colleague, Dr. Bashane at Harvard, did this uh, several years ago, uh, many years ago actually, uh, 2012, and found out that he gave different levels of co-administered testosterone from, I believe, 50 milligrams uh, a week up to 600 milligrams a week, and he saw a dose-dependent increase in muscle mass. 
and strength too. And despite blocking with the DHT blocker uh, dutasteride. So that's incredible. So in that case, blocking DHT with a DHT blocker one and two did not have an adverse uh, outcome on skeletal muscle strength and growth hypertrophy. Amazing. But will it happen, of course, up into the brain, which I think it will. It's, I, I know that it will. So you're trading off. So in the end, what to do? What do you do? Don't do any of these drugs. Uh, don't do steroids or SARMs if you're worried for any of these side effects at all, because the steroid or the SARM itself by itself is one issue, obviously potentially dangerous and everything has side effects. And the next issue is, are you engaging in polypharmacy? So a drug for a drug for a drug. And my patients know this. I talk openly with my patients about this. And if some men would like in my practice to monitor and to watch DHT, not to mention estrogen levels, I'm humble to do it. I'm, of course I'm there to do it. In the end of the day, I provide them with what I feel independently how it should be done, and we monitor things closely with them. I, I check their labs, I check these things that I'm gonna recommend in a moment for you. And that's the ethical way to do it, you know, to do this for a patient, and physicians should be doing that. Expert physicians like myself that are, that are they're internal medicine doctors or endocrinologists, even urologists, family practice doctors or nurse practitioners, they should be more involved and they should be sharing and, and helping to, to hear patients and to work through this. Because there's no, there's, there's, they, these are not life and death scenarios, they, they, but these are cosmetic issues and they are very important though. So what should you do? You should obviously get a history and physical exam. The labs, what labs can you do? Everyone loves to focus on the labs, so here we go. What labs can you do, baseline and then monitoring? Total and free testosterone, of course, DHT level, ultra-sensitive estrogen, prolactin, a full thyroid panel, a very full and detailed thyroid panel is always good to see at least once. PSA, of course, if you're a middle-aged man or older, uh, you're gonna wanna get a PSA. Always stay in touch with a very good doctor about PSA, because that itself now has, uh, um, uh, is, is some conflicting evidence on should we really manage men for screening with prostate cancer with a PSA. So please talk to a very good urologist or a very good internal medicine uh, doctor. Uh, and then in the end, you can balance. You can really balance with testosterone. This, I'm referring more to using testosterone on men. You know, th these are TRT guys where I, I'm going to use other agents and balance them to help them maintain their hair. And in the end, my guys know that I, I do the best I can, but how long and sustainable are you going to do this for? And how realistic is it? And what side effects uh, are going to come into play? So can you balance testosterone, estrogen, and DHT for a man using different medicines on TRT, not to mention steroids and SARMs and some of these other uh, medicines, DHT blockers? Can you do it? Um, you can. It's a lot of work and it has to be uh, done man per man. But in the end of the day, everything I do is, of course, just to help men because I love to be a physician uh, just for men. Thank you so much, I hope this helps. Dr. Thomas O'Connor here. I'm glad you made it to the end of the video. If you liked it, hit the like button and please subscribe to our channel. And I look forward to bringing you more cool and interesting videos just like this in the future. Stay strong and healthy. Thank you.